Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Esquire Magazine calls Dom Winslow one of the best thriller writers on the planet. He is the author of 22 best-selling crime novels that explore such broad-ranging topics as the socio-political underpinnings of the war on drugs, law enforcement, criminal hierarchies, and international politics. These books include the Cartel Trilogy, The Power of the Dog, The Cartel, and The Border, The Force, and Savages, for which he wrote the screenplay for the Oliver Stone film. Winslow formerly worked as a private investigator, anti-terrorist trainer, arson trial consultant, safari guide, and director of Shakespeare. In a review in The Guardian of his latest New York Times bestseller, City on Fire, Laura Wilson writes, Winslow's cartel trilogy is an astonishing achievement that will be hard to beat, but on the strength of this immersive and humane tale of fate, free will, loyalty, and betrayal, his new series will rank alongside it. In perhaps his final appearance at the Free Library of Philadelphia, please welcome Don Winslow. Thank you very much. It's great to be back in Philadelphia, great to be back at the library. Uh, if anyone wants to move down front, that, that's fine too. It's not the Shamu show, you won't get splashed, I, I promise you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I know the publisher would like me to talk about the book, but the publisher's not here, so I can do what I want. Uh, and I'd like to spend a, a minute or two talking about libraries. Is that okay with you all? Um, I think we sometimes forget what a revolutionary, and I mean that word, I selected that word, revolutionary thing the free public lending library was. Because prior to the advent of buildings like this, uh, the only people who had access to knowledge were the rich. You had to have money to buy books. You had to have money to go to subscription libraries. When institutions like this started, knowledge became available to everybody. And I think that that was a major contributor to, to the formation of democracy. I have more personal reasons for loving libraries. My mom was a librarian. I grew up in a, a little fishing town in New England where most of this book is set, make the publisher happy, most of this book uh, was set. And um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, and it was a, a tiny town, you know, obviously on the coast where most fishing villages are kept. And uh, the expectations of us as, as kids were not high. Uh, the town since rebounded, but in, in those days when I was growing up, the, the fishing had pretty much played out. You, you couldn't even be a fisherman if, if that was your desire. Uh, the factories uh, that had once inhabited the red brick buildings of the town had moved south and eventually overseas. Uh, but in that little library, and, and that library was maybe a third of the size of this room, built in the 1870s. Uh, I found the world, you know. I could go 10 feet that way and be in France, 12 feet that way and be in Africa. Uh, and I discovered I could not only travel in space, I could travel in time, yeah? I could be in 1789 in France. I could be in 1403 in Africa. And I used to sit, you know, prowl those aisles just greedy about books. Uh, I have a degree in African history and, and where that began was sitting on the floor in that little old library looking at those books. Uh, and also the, the dream uh, to become a writer. You know, uh, I've said it before, uh, my dad was a sailor who loved books. My mom a librarian who loved a sailor. There were always just books and stories around our house all the time and I thought if I could do that for a living, if I could tell stories in one form or another, that would be the very, very best thing in the world to be. It, it took the world a number of decades to agree with my assessment, but, but here we are. Um, so I will talk about this book. This uh, uh, City on Fire is the first time I've gone back to that town to write about it. It was a homecoming of sorts. 
I think homecomings are always difficult, as maybe some of you have experienced. I left that town when I was 17 years old because there was nothing there for me. Uh, wandered the world. Uh, I think Andy mentioned uh, a couple of the things that I did. I hasten to add I was a photographic safari guide in Africa. The only thing I shot were cameras. Uh, and then settled out in California. A lot of my books are set in, on the West Coast and in Mexico. But I finally came home uh, about 10 years ago, maybe a little less than that. Uh, my wife and I started going back to Rhode Island for longer periods of time uh, to take care of my mother, who was in her declining years. Uh, you probably, uh, most of you know kind of what that's about. And it was a, a melancholy time. You know, and we started to be there for longer and longer periods as necessity dictated. Uh, but during that time, I fell in love with the place again. Maybe I was seeing it through more mature eyes. I don't know. But I, I started to really feel the beauty of the beaches and the cliffs and, and the, the old fishing port, uh, the soulfulness of the place. Uh, and the people, and I, I decided that maybe it was time to come home in a literary sense as well. Uh, <clears throat> the other origin story of, of this book, and this is the first of a trilogy, so I guess properly speaking, these three books, um, comes from the classics. Uh, in the mid-1990s, I realized how ignorant I was. Uh, I have a very, very narrow education. I have a, a BA in African history and an MA in military history which not only makes you a hardcore unemployable, um, <laughs> it, it also deprives you of knowledge that you would otherwise maybe have gotten in college of, of kind of literature in general. I knew crime literature very well. I was immersed in that because it's a great love. And I knew Shakespeare uh, very well because I, I made my living for a while directing uh, Shakespeare plays. But beyond that, I was really dumb. And uh, so I picked up one of those great books lists. You know, there are dozens of them, and I, I picked one of them up, and I decided I'm going to read through this entire list uh, in this sort of autodidactic, kind of Jude the Obscure way. I didn't know who Jude the Obscure was. That came about two years into reading this thing. It took me seven years uh, to read through this list. But early on, uh, I came across... Obviously, the Greek classics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the tragic dramas. I came across uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, and it, it, it's an odd thing. Uh, reading those stories and those characters and those themes reminded me very much of real-life events that had happened in the world of crime when I was growing up uh, in New England. And it reminded me a lot of crime fiction, and I realized that all of the themes that we treat in, in my beloved crime genre, and I consider myself very much within that genre, the Greeks and the Romans had already done. You know, honor, dishonor, loyalty, revenge, compassion, love, lust, hatred, murder, killing, all of the things, and fate, very importantly, fate, the things that we deal with in crime fiction those guys had already done. And, uh, and I had this idea, not terribly original. James Joyce certainly did it well before me uh, in Ulysses. But I had this idea, could I take the stories of the Iliad and the Aeneid and the Odyssey and somehow merge them with crime stories? Uh, true stories that, that I knew when I was a kid, when I read the Iliad. Again, it was very familiar to me already. Uh, the Trojan Wars, for instance, very famously happened in an argument over a, a woman, Helen of Troy. A uh, very, very similar incident happened in, on the beach in New England when I was growing up. And I think it was 36 lives, and 10 years later, that conflict ended. Of course, those conflicts are always about money, power, and turf. The woman was just the pretext, you know, for an invasion. Uh, but I thought, could I, could I write crime novels that were completely modern. You could read them without knowledge of or reference to the classics at all and hopefully enjoy them as just straight-up crime novels. But if you had some nodding acquaintance with, with the classics, you'd go, huh, is Pam Helen of Troy? You know, could that be a Trojan horse? 
You know, who's, who's Achilles in this? And, and every character in these three books has an analogous character uh, in the classics. So um, I, I came up with this character, Danny Ryan, who, who starts the first book as a fisherman and a longshoreman, working class guy who just uh, wants to be married and, and have a kid uh, in Rhode Island. And, uh, but he marries the um, youngest daughter of the Irish crime boss. Uh, in Providence. And uh, because of that, he gets dragged into a war uh, with the Italian mob in Providence. And when I was growing up in Rhode Island, um, organized crime was a real power, a real influence. It was very much there. I wasn't directly involved in it, nor were my family. But it was always around, you know, the 19-year-old the mafioso wannabe on the corner who kept an eye on a block or two for the bosses. Uh, you could run to if you got into trouble. Uh, I swear to God, every business had vending machines in it in Rhode Island in those days. Doctors' offices had vending machines in it. And, and if I remember correctly, although I might be making this up, some of them were cigarette machines uh, in the early years. So you were always aware of that, you know, and aware of the mob wars that, that were going on. Um, and so the research for this book was, was more or less consulting the realm of memory, you know, and, and walking out the door and going to these various sites and locations where the book takes place. Um, so anyway, Danny marries the um, daughter of an Irish mob boss. And at this point in time, the Italians and the Irish in, in OC are friends and allies. They've, they've divided up the world. They've divided up their spheres. The Irish had a certain amount of the gambling, and they had the um, hijacking of trucks and the, the longshoremen's unions and things like that. And the, the Italians had the vending machines and most of the gambling and, and some other uh, what were then vices, numbers running, which has now become a civic virtue called the lottery. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said that any vice society can't control, they turn into a virtue. And, you know, we've certainly seen that over the past few decades. But they're all buddies and uh, work together. And uh, I'm actually going to read to you a few pages, if that's acceptable to you, if that's okay. I, I normally assume that people who hang out in libraries can read. Uh, so I rarely read, but I've become kind of fond of reading this section, and, uh, and so I'm going to. Uh, it's about a uh, clam bake. Pasco Ferry's clam bake. Pasco Ferry being the, uh, the godfather of New England, uh, about to retire from that position. But every August on this beach, and it's a beach where I grew up, uh, it's a beach where I, I'm there every afternoon, six months a year. It's the, the beach I walked after my dad's funeral. Uh, I, I could not attend my mother's because of COVID. Uh, but when we finally got back there months later, I took sort of a memorial walk on this beach. So this is an intensely personal book, and uh, these are locations that mean a lot to me. So Pasco has a house on this beach, and he throws a big clam bake every year, and he invites everybody, the Irish and the Italians, and, and they do this thing. And um, shortly after the passage I'm about to read to you, things fall apart, and they're never going to be friends again. So uh, I'll just take a second to find the passage, if that's all right. Uh, and we'll go from there. Is that a way of going? And then afterwards, I think we'll do Q&A. Is that right, Andrew? Or yeah, OK. Pasco Ferry's Clambake, as seen through the eyes of Danny Ryan, our protagonist. Christ, the food, Danny thinks. The clams, the quahogs, the crabs. The huge pots of spaghetti and gravy, stuffed peppers, and sweet Italian sausage. The joke is that the Irish are never, ever allowed to cook at these things. But one time Marty wraps a potato in tinfoil and had Danny secretly bury it in the coals. And when Pasco dug the clams out, he found that spud and yelled, Marty, you old mick. God, how they eat. The food never stops. After the shellfish and the pasta, the sausage and the peppers, the women bring out big boxes of the sweet little Italian cookies from Cantonella's Bakery in Knightsville. Only Cantonella's cookies will do. Someone always is designated to stop in Cranston on the way down from the city and pick up those cookies. 
How sweet those cookies are against the strong, bitter espresso. And how good the hot coffee feels going down as the fog comes in and the night gets colder. Mary always keeps sweatshirts in the house, big, thick sweatshirts worn pale by use and sun. Someone has brought a mandolin outside and is playing while Pasco sings a sweet, sad ballad in Italian. His voice comes out of the fog like it drifted across the Atlantic from Napoli, an old song from an old country that washes up on this new world shore like driftwood. Pasco finishes the song, and it's very quiet. He says, your turn, Marty. Nah, Marty says. It's a ritual. Marty demurs. Pasco insists. Then Marty lets himself be persuaded into singing. Of all the money e'er I had, I spent it in good company. And all the harm I've ever done, alas, it was but none to me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night, and joy be with you all. How they had fought each other, these two immigrant tribes, for a place to put their feet. The Irish in Dogtown, the Italians on Federal Hill, toe halls carved out of grudging New England granite. The old Yankees hated them, hated their bog trotters who came to the ruin their Protestant city with their Catholic saints and their candles, their smelly food, their incontinent breeding. First, it was the Irish back around the Civil War who filled the tenements outside the slaughter yards that teemed with packs of feral mutts prowling for offal and giving the neighborhood its name, Dogtown. The men worked the slaughterhouses, the quarries, the tool factories, making fortunes for the old Yankee families, then marched off to die in the war. And those who came back came back determined to claim a piece of the city. They came out of Dogtown and took the firehouses and the police precincts. Then they organized the wards and voted themselves into political, if not economic, power, satisfied to run the city if they couldn't own it. Around the turn of the century, the Italians came from Naples or somewhere in the Mezzogiorno and fought the Irish. Two peoples battling each other for the crumbs off the master's plate until they finally figured out that together they had the numbers to take the whole table. They carved the city up like a roast beef, but were smart enough to leave the old Yankees sufficient slices to keep them fat and happy. Oh, all the comrades e'er I had. They're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts e'er I had, they'd wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I gently rise and softly call. Good night, and joy be with you all. One night at the Clambake, Danny saw Pasco Ferry reach out and touch Marty's hand. And they both started laughing. Sitting there full of food and wine, wrapped in the warmth of their friends and families, their children and grandchildren, they just laughed. And Danny wondered about the things they had seen, the things they had done to share that clam bake on the beach. Pasco seemed to see the question in Danny's eyes and unbidden said, we didn't outfight the old Yankees. He paused to make sure that the children were in bed and the women were in the house and then continued, we outloved them. We took our women to bed and made babies. It was true. What had made them poor Small houses crowded with hungry mouths had made them rich. What had ostensibly made them weak had made them powerful. If I had money enough to spend and leisure time to sit a while, there is a fair maid in this town that sorely has my heart beguiled. Her rosy cheeks and ruby lips 
I own she has my heart in thrall. Then fill to me the parting glass. Good night, and joy be with you all. Thank you. Could you comment on, I guess, uh, from your previous trilogy, uh, uh, the United States' war on drugs and then what uh, Portugal has done in the last, since 2000 yeah. with their uh, mm -hmm. concept? Thank yeah. You. The, the, um, the gentleman was asked, well, you, you heard the question, he had a mic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can comment on the war on drugs. The war on drugs should never have been fought. It was a tragedy. Once you define it as a war, you've already lost that war because it's not a military problem. It, it's not a criminal problem. It's a social health problem. And um, we will never solve the drug problem by attacking the supply end. We can only solve it by attacking the demand end. I'll get to Portugal in a second, I promise. Um, what I generally say on this subject is that we have never asked, never mind answered, the important question. And the important question is what hurts? Opioids, for instance, are always a response to pain. Most drugs are. And thank God we have them. But what hurts? What hurts so much in our society that we spend $60 billion a year on illegal drugs and God knows how much on prescription? Opioids, right? Billions, billions. What hurts? Where's the pain? If, if, if you go to a doctor, the first thing that he or she is going to ask you is what? Where does it hurt? We don't ask that question, never mind answer it. Is, is it social? Is it racial? Is it economic? I suspect sometimes it's the loneliness of a highly acquisitive society. But until we answer that question, we're never going to solve the drug problem. Now, Portugal has legalized drugs. And what happened is what we all expected to happen. There was an immediate and terrifying spike in drug use. Way up, shot right up, and very quickly came way, way down to below the levels that it had been. So it's a successful experiment. Now, people will, I think, quite correctly say, well, they're two very different countries. <laughs> Portugal is a very small country, you know. Um, with a lot of its families, you know, life still intact, um, as ours is perhaps not. So it's not an exact comparison, but I think it's a good example. But yes, what we should do is legalize all drugs tomorrow. On average, how long does it take you to write a book? Um, there is no average, sir. I wish there were. Uh, I would say for most of my books that are around three to 400 pages in length, um, it's about two years, but uh, I did a book a while back called The Power of the Dog that was considerably longer than that. Uh, that took six years. I think The Cartel took me maybe four years. Uh, and these books collectively, yeah, around six years. So that, that's about average. Yeah. Are you saying, they're, are they all written already, Don? Are the books all written already? They are, all three of these books. Yeah, pretty much. Look, I, I often write two books at a time. Uh, it's a, one of the rare cases where the ADD helps. Um, so I have a morning book and an afternoon book. Because I know that by about, I start work at 5.30 in the morning. And so I know that by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, anything I started writing at 5.30 in the morning, I'm just going to write garbage and end up throwing it away. It's completely useless activity. And so I'll jump to the next pony. You know, I like to have a couple of horses in the corral. Um, and so I'll, I'll jump ahead and write something else. But yes, you, you become, for good or ill, by the way, totally absorbed in that book. When it was the drug books, it was for ill. You know, those were rough years. When I'm writing surfer books, you know, about guys joking around surfing in San Diego, then it's good, you know. I see like a huge difference in your like prose style from the books you wrote before Savages and Kings of Cool and mm -hmm. the ones you wrote afterwards. Was that natural or was that like a conscious choice? It was, I think, an evolution. Uh, yeah, I think you noticed it correctly. There was a huge, huge change in style. Look, the, the first chapter of the book he alluded to, Savages, has two words. The second one is you, and, and the first isn't. 
when you write a chapter like that, you're, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're dropping the gloves, aren't you? You're, you're just saying, look, I'm going to write whatever I feel like, however I feel like writing it. Uh, that book is, is all about language. I just wanted to capture a certain kind of Southern California kind of language and culture. But yeah, it was more of an evolution. Look, I mean, I, I hope you get better at your job. Do you know what I mean? I think it'd be sad if like, you know, 30 something years on, I was writing the same book in the same style. I think I'd be bored to tears and none of you would be here, you know? So, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, it's okay. Okay, yeah, it was the first book of mine a lot of people read. Uh, and then it became a film, and then a lot more people went back and read it. But it was fun to write. I wrote the first 14 pages in this crazy burst one morning, uh, emailed it to my agent and said, either this is good or I've, I've really gone crazy. You know, I've just lost it. And he wrote back and said, uh, drop everything else you're doing and finish this book. And it was something like a year and a half later it was on the screen. I mean, it really went fast. So, yeah. Another question. I think they're going to go to some other rows people back, back here. Yep. Yeah, just a couple rows back, and then we'll bounce to your left, Anna. Uh, I love this book. I just finished it a couple of days ago. I listened to it. Well, thank you. And so my question is about audio books. Yeah. Uh, the guy who narrates your book is just tremendous and really brings it to life. Not quite as good as your reading tonight, but... Um, uh, now that a few of your books have become movies, are you, when you were writing, affected by that and kind of thinking of it as a movie? And also, can you just talk about the, the working with a collaborator or how he collaborates with you? And, and uh, do you mean in film or on the audio book? The I mean the audio book because okay. I was so impressed with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I never think about movies or television when I'm writing a book. Um, now, listen, I, I don't want to be disingenuous. Literally everything I've ever written has been optioned or bought by television or film. Very few of them have made so far, but they've all been bought. And so I know that that's a probability, you know. Uh, but if I were to think about a future film or a future television show, there are two things that could happen, both of them bad. I would write a really bad film treatment or a really bad novel because they are different breeds of cat with different needs. So I deliberately turn that off. I just write the book. I never think about actors or anything else. In terms of collaboration on the audio book, um, not much. What they do is they'll send me sort of clips from maybe 10 different people reading. Uh, and then I listen to them and I go, OK, him, or in some cases, her. Yeah. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Me too. Uh, I'm a recent follower. Okay. I've started following you in the past two years on Twitter. Uh huh. I'm waiting for you to follow me back. Because oh. <laughs> you said you were going to do that recently, and you didn't. Um, we'll get there. Yes, we'll get there. Okay. What? So I so I apologize if this is redundant. So I ha kind of have two questions. One: What is your process like? Do you know the end of your book when you begin it? How do you structure mm -hmm. your work or your time? Mm -hmm. And then my second question is um, really more of a comment. Thank you for the work you're doing. Well, it's very gracious of you. Thank you. Um, and I and I can't wait to read the book, but I mean the the new work that you're doing. It's thank, thank you. you very much. That, that's very nice of you. Um, I do not know the ending of the book. I don't outline. Um, I, I, you know, it, look, the, it's a job, definitely, and it's work, definitely, but it's work I love, and it should be fun. If it's not fun, you should be doing something else entirely. So a big part of the fun for me is just like pushing the boat out on the water. Do you know what I mean? Like, write that first sentence, write that first chapter, and then let's see where we go. Um, I like to be surprised when I'm writing. Because I think if I'm surprised, the reader's going to be surprised. So sometimes I'll just deliberately paint myself into a corner, you know? Because I figure if I'm in that corner, you're in that corner with me, and you might find that kind of fun. You know, how are we going to get out of here, <laughs> you know? Um, I once started a, a novella with just the sentence that had been running in my mind forever. It's my favorite ever sentence I've ever written, by the way. Uh, no one knows how the chimp got the revolver. Um, and I didn't know how the chimp got the revolver, and 
I didn't know how that phrase was running through my head for years, but it was. I would you know, be taking a walk, and I'd think, <laughs> no one knows how the chimp got the revolver, and I'd crack myself up, you know, I'd just laugh at it. Um, and, uh, and so one day I thought, all right, how did the damn chimp get the revolver? And I just started typing, and pretty soon I've got this young cop, you know, who has to answer the call, you know, come to the zoo, a chimp has a revolver, you know, stat, you know, and trying to talk the chimp down from this tree, you know, and give up the gun, and, you know, other cops are asking if they have any police officers who speak, speak chimp, and, you know, it was it's just a very silly story, but I didn't know how it ended until I typed the ending. And I had a good time with it, and I think other people did as well. But even with sort of bigger works like this, you have a rough idea of the character's arc, but no details, because it's, it sounds airy-fairy, I know, but characters will do and say things you did not expect them to do or say. And quite often, that will take the story off into a different direction you hadn't intended. And what I've learned over the years yeah, is that uh, I should stay with that for 10 or 20 pages uh, because it, it usually is better than what I had. Yeah, sometimes it's not, and then you've wasted 10 or 20 pages, but so what? Nobody died, you know, so it's all good. Don, Thank I you. have a question for you. Yeah. Do you find that first sentence will often set the tone of what comes after? Oh. Because that whole story is sort of, it's, it's really funny. Thank you. Um, and that line just yeah. sort of leads us did it lead you to the humor that pervaded the, the tale? Yeah. The first sentence is everything um, for aspiring writers. I mean, the first sentence sets the tone, obviously, for the reader, but it also sets the tone for the writer. I will spend far more time on the first sentence of a book or a piece than anything else. Um, Raymond Chandler, you know, wrote great first sentences. Elmore Leonard wrote great first sentences. Uh, I like to, to write first sentences that imply questions because it keeps the reader reading. My first book, the first sentence was, he never should have answered the phone. Well, who's he? What was the phone call? Why shouldn't he have answered it? You know, uh, The first sentence of this book I wrote 27 years ago, and I've never changed it by a syllable. You know, uh, So yeah, that first sentence is, is just everything. And if you want to read sheer noir poetry, Read the first sentence of Raymond Chandler's The Long Goodbye, the best P.I. book ever written. The first time I saw Terry Lennox, he was drunk, leaning against a silver Rolls Royce Wraith. Um, it's, it's just sheer beauty. Yeah. yeah. More questions? Yeah, we're going <laughs> to keep... He's not going to call on well, you for I'm I'm gonna, telling you. So. We may circle back. You can we always ask in line. To you. Sir? Hi, Don. Welcome to Philadelphia. I was wondering if you could speak about... Oh, here you um, are. Hi. ...what's going on with the uh, production of your your cartel trilogy, you know, as far as putting it on film. I am missing a meeting right now, but I'd rather be here with you. <laughs> um, the cartel trilogy is being made into a multi-year um, television series on the FX network, and it's steaming right along, and I think they're going to start shooting in September. Yeah, so thank you. Very pleased with it. Who's directing it, can you say? Uh, I, I shouldn't say at this point. Okay. How you doing? Um, I was wondering, since you kind of bridged into talking about some of the novellas, you brought back a lot of the old characters like yeah. Neil Carey and the Dawn Patrol. Um, was there a particular reason you revisited them? Because I was thrilled to see them all again. Thank you. Was, just for fun? Just for fun. But here, here's a slightly embarrassing story about that. One of the stories in the novellas in that volume is set in Kauai in a certain year. Uh, I brought actually characters that I believed were dead and Oliver Stone believed were alive uh, from, from Savages. And uh, I, I was 10 pages into that novella when I realized, when I remembered, that I had left characters from two other books on that island in the same year. Shit. <laughs> so you couldn't help it, right? You could not help it. And I thought, well, what would happen if they met? You know, what would, what would be the result? Let's play with this. And, you know, I did. And I even snuck a character. That, and no one's ever mentioned it to me from a book called California Life into that novella. Uh, but, um, yeah, it was fun. You know, Neil Carey was a character in my first five books uh, when I thought I'd be a series writer. And then, you know, I left that. But then coming back, I thought, well, whatever happened to Neil? 
you know, we're decades down the line. He always wanted to be a professor of English lit. Okay, Neil, you got your wish. I'm going to make you a professor of English lit, you know, at, at UCS, the University of California at San Diego, and put you in with some other characters. So it, it was just fun. It was just fun to do, revisit those guys. Hi. Um, I love you on Twitter. I Thank you. I am just wondering, I, don't, I noticed on Sunday, on the um, CBS Sunday morning, you said you were going to retire from writing. And I'm, yes. I'm very curious and interested in the activity that you want to get into on the political side. Yeah. Um, for the past, well, a number of years ago, I took out an ad in the Washington Post, a full-page ad to President Obama and to Congress advocating the uh, end of the war on drugs, legalizing drugs. I never heard from a single politician. I did hear from probably 50 or 60 cops. Um, and I'm really, and, and most of them were, began as hostile conversations. Uh, cops can get your phone number, right? <laughs> it's not, not a problem. And, uh, but I'm very proud to say that there are now drug treatment centers in two jails in major American cities because of those conversations. Uh, later on, at the beginning of the previous administration, I, I took out an ad uh, advocating um, reform, sentencing reform and prison reform. Then 2016, um, and you all can do the math, uh, I felt that, um, I'm not a big name, you know, but uh, I have something of a platform and something of an audience, and I thought um, that we were at an existential moment in American democracy, we're, I thought, headed toward a shoddy fascism, as if there's any other kind. Um, and I thought that I should use whatever voice I had to, to speak out against things that, that I thought were very wrong. Um, uh, statements that were made about Mexicans and Mexican Americans who are my friends and neighbors. Those are people I love. And when people started salting them, I got fighting mad. Still am. Um, and it evolved, you know, and, and started to gather more and more. And then my, my good friend Shane Salerno and I uh, started to make videos. You know, I do the Twitter, and, and together we do the videos, and um, using his skills as a filmmaker. And we did videos to, particularly during the last presidential campaign. And people like Bruce Springsteen helped us out, and Jeff Daniels, and, uh, and I, I think they had some effect. Uh, we're still at that existential moment. I, I thought it was over until the events of January 6th, uh, proving that the other side will do anything, say anything. So I've come to a point in my life um, where I've had far more success than I ever thought I'd have, ever dreamed, probably ever deserved, you know. Uh, and um, I, I think now is the time to devote whatever talents I have to, to this fight that's not over. Um, and you, you saw it just the other day, didn't you? Uh, so uh, that's what I'm doing. I'll just continue to do what we've been doing. Uh, we're, we're recruiting a digital army if anyone wants to you know, sign up. Uh, to form sort of rapid response teams that when these scurrilous lies and accusations come out, uh, bam, we can be right on top of them and get that out in social media to keep producing videos, to keep urging people to donate to candidates and, of course, to vote. Uh, and that's what I'll be doing for the foreseeable future. When you read, is there an author or authors that you like especially? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, the list is so long. You know, I, I has it, I, three, sure, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Jim Harrison. Within the crime genre, um, Raymond Chandler, uh, the late, great, irreplaceable Elmore Leonard. I'm still mourning the loss of Elmore Leonard. Um, if you ask me what the best crime novel ever written was, I, I tell you George V. Higgins, The Friends of Eddie Coyle which was also a wonderful film. If you've never seen it, it's, it's on the Criterion Collection. Robert Mitchum, Peter Boyle, it's a beautiful, beautiful, gritty 1970s movie. Uh, right now, uh, I am reading, rereading George Eliot's Middlemarch. Um, it's sort of a travel strategy. If you're hitting 23 cities in 22 days, you want to have one book with you. 
<laughs> it has to be a fat paperback, you know. And so I was looking at the shelves at home, and I thought I haven't read Middlemarch in a while, which might be the greatest novel ever, I think, along with War and Peace. Uh, so, yeah, but the list is so long, you know, the list is so long. There's so many great writers out there, and, uh, and within the crime genre. You know, it's self-serving to say, but I think that some of the best writing going uh, is in the crime genre. So going with that then, Don, how did you get in professionally, especially with an agent? Was it luck? Was it lots of work? Did you know somebody? <laughs> Was it a little of all three? A little of all three. I've, I've had four agents, um, and it was only on the fourth with Shane that just really turned my career around. Uh, but mostly it's work. You know, it's, it's just trying to consistently write good stuff and, and, you know, and hope that eventually somebody notices and then really strongly advocates for you because that's really what you need through the whole process, from the writing, through the marketing, through the touring and everything. You, you, you have to have that strong advocate. Just saying, uh, thank you very much for being here tonight, and thank you for the words that you have for your Mexican uh, neighbors. Uh, I think they're really needed, uh, me being one of them. Okay. And uh, I'm actually curious about your books uh, regarding the, uh, the cartels. And what has been the, uh, at the point made by your neighbors down south, maybe officials or maybe people? I wonder on how they have responded to those books. Do you mean to my, you know, I live 20 miles from the border, yeah. Um, and so I live in a, in a very rural area that, that I would say, you know, about a third of the people are either Mexican or Mexican-American, another maybe 20% are Native American, and the rest are, you know, Anglo ranchers. Uh, voted 76% Republican in the last election. Uh, but on the issue of Mexico, I think that I've gained some traction uh, because I've made the point that the so-called Mexican drug problem is not the Mexican drug problem, it's the American drug problem. It's Mexico who pays for it in their blood as we send $60 billion a year down to the violent psychopaths of the cartels. If anyone should build a goddamn wall, it should be Mexico to keep American money and American guns out. Um, and so when you live in an area like mine, the, the culture's so blended, do you know what I mean? That we go, you know, we're at weddings together and high school graduations and birthday parties. And, and so the, the sort of bloody battlefield that some people like to picture as the border is, is 180 degrees from the reality that I know. Is that answering the question you ask? So even a lot of these, you know, conservative old cowboys, right, you know, are, are you know, they have Mexican-American sisters-in-laws and nieces and, you know, friends. And, and so it, it, it's not what these clowns who, I'm getting, see, I sh shouldn't have done this because I'm getting worked up. I go, in, I go into a ramp, but I, I can't stand these bozo politicians who go down to the border for two hours flanked by, you know, a hundred armed guards, talk to one border patrol agent for 25 minutes, get their film clip, and then come back up to goddamn Cleveland to, to tell us what it's like at the border. Sorry, I, I just went through this. And so, you know, I, I think that it's a much more complex and much more variegated world than it's pictured. Sorry for the temper tantrum, I apologize. The book is sitting on fire. The author is Don Winslow. Please give him one more round of applause. Thank you.